part two of custer's last battle of custer battlefield by robert m utley this librivox recording is in the public domain section two d battle of the little bighorn reno besieged rescue pursuit war's end why reno besieged custer had plunged into battle without captain benteen's battalion still a dozen miles back on the trail benteen's march to the left had taken him far enough to see into the little bighorn valley and ensure that no indians occupied that portion of it he had then turned back on the trail of custer and reno reaching it just in advance of captain mcdougall and the slow-moving pack train a mile farther the battalion halted for fifteen minutes at a swampy morass in the creek bed and watered their horses the march continued through the old sioux and cheyenne campsite with its lone teepee still burning in another mile sergeant knipe galloped up to benteen repeated custer's orders and continued back on the trail to find mcdougall within the next mile trumpeter martin his horse bleeding from a bullet wound in the hip arrived with the penciled note from cook to bring the packs and be quick the note prompted benteen to order a trot down reno creek the battalion pushed approaching the little bighorn in time to see the last of reno's men retreating from the valley one of the crow scouts appeared and directed benteen to the bluffs on his right where the reno survivors were gathering a short gallop brought benteen's companies to the heights a few indians pressed the position but skirmishers quickly drove them back reno hatless a red bandana tied around his head exclaimed for god's sake benteen halt your command and help me i've lost half my men where was custer benteen asked everyone else was asking the same question but no one knew the sound of heavy and continuous firing drifted down from the north and two distinct volleys echoed over the hills neither reno nor benteen made any move to rush to the sound of the firing as required by the orders martin had brought captain thomas b weir believed the distant firing should be investigated and started toward reno to urge it then decided to ride along the bluffs to the north to see if he could learn more his lieutenant winfield s edgerly supposing that authority to move out had been granted followed weir with company d later the remaining companies reflecting the indecision of their leaders strung out on weir's trail company b in the pack train bringing up the rear topping the high pinnacle now known as weir point weir scanned the terrain to the north to the left lay the valley full of tepees to the front weir point fell away to medicine trail coulee beyond the land rose to distant hills and ridges obscured by rolling dust indistinctly amid the dust recalled lieutenant edgerly we saw a good many indians galloping up and down and firing at objects on the ground then as lieutenant edward s godfrey recounted clouds of dust arose from all parts of the field and the horsemen converged toward our position the warriors came up the north face of weir point exhilarated by their triumph over custer the companies had deployed around the hill but the battle had scarcely opened before they began to fall back reno himself concerned for the wounded and the lagging pack train had not come forward and the withdrawal took place with the same lack of direction as the advance godfrey commander of company k saw the danger of a disorderly retreat and posting his men in a dismounted skirmish line held the indians back while the rest of the command regained the original position on the bluff top the indians pressed so closely that the troops had no chance to prepare a defence hastily dismounting everyone hit the ground and as godfrey declared spread himself out as thin as possible carbine fire halted the indian advance and drove the warriors to cover before they could overrun the position the cavalry horses and pack mules were herded into a swale that offered a little shelter dr henry r porter a civilian under contract to the army and the only surviving doctor had the wounded laid out in this natural depression with the horses and mules providing uncertain protection from flying bullets and arrows they pounded at us all of what was left of the first day said benteen for three hours until night brought relief the beleaguered cavalrymen endured a continuous and destructive fire from all sides 
the warriors worked into positions close to the hilltop kept their adversaries pinned down and killed or wounded eleven soldiers a few defenders managed to get behind a saddle or pack but most considered themselves fortunate to have even a sagebrush in front of them darkness fell about nine o'clock and the firing ceased most of the indians returned to the village for a great war dance illuminated by leaping bonfires and for mourning rituals in recognition of their own dead from reno hill the soldiers could hear the drums and chants and see the fires splashing the night sky the cavalrymen made good use of the hours of darkness scooping out shallow entrenchments with knives tin cups mess gear and any other tool that could supplement the handful of shovels with the pack train from packs ammunition boxes saddles and dead horses and mules they threw together makeshift barricades some three hundred and fifty soldiers and packers formed a circle around the depression where porter had established his hospital the swale resembled a saucer with the eastern side missing major reno held the north rim of the saucer with most of the companies benteen occupied the south side an elliptical ridge with h company mcdougall and company b and captain thomas h french with company m defended the west rim from which the bluffs dropped precipitously to the little bighorn captain miles moylan and company a plugged the gap in the saucer on the east at first light trumpeter martin sounded reveille and a single rifle shot answered to open the second day of the battle of the little bighorn from all sides the indians poured arrows and bullets into the defences of reno hill the soldiers now dug in and better protected fired back whenever a target offered although the warriors proved adept at drawing fire without getting hit throughout the hot morning the fight continued without let-up the indians drew closer around the lines taking skilful advantage of the irregular terrain and scattered sagebrush to stay hidden at times they threatened to mass for an attack especially on benteen's exposed and thinly held position benteen himself strode about in full view refusing to take cover and disdaining the fire directed at him on one occasion he roused his men to their feet and led them in a charge that broke up a force of warriors gathering for an assault on another he went to reno and demanded a general counter-attack led by reno the troopers rose from their pits and surged forward on all fronts to drive back the encircling indians thirst tormented the defenders especially the wounded in the hospital area dr porter served notice that his charges must have water at any hazard four sharpshooters stood to distract the enemy and provide covering fire a volunteer party slipped down a ravine to the river filled canteens and camp kettles and hastened back to the hilltop they got little water but it was enough to afford some relief to the wounded early in the afternoon the fire began to slacken by late afternoon only an occasional shot reminded the men to stay behind cover in the valley the indians fired the dry prairie grass a wall of thick smoke screened the village about seven p m an immense procession of horsemen women and children on foot travois ponies and dogs emerged from behind the smoke slowly it wound up the slope on the west side of the valley and made its way across the benchland to the southwest toward the bighorn mountains below the valley appeared deserted save for scattered debris of the great indian camp rescue on reno hill the cavalrymen watched the exodus from the valley and speculated on its meaning none knew what had happened to custer none knew why the indians were leaving none could shake the fear that the next morning would bring fresh waves of warriors against the hilltop during the night the troops buried their dead and moved closer to the river lieutenant de rudio and most of the soldiers and scouts left in the timber the day before made their way into the lines they had remained concealed for a harrowing thirty-six hours while indians came and went nearby next morning a blue column could be seen approaching up the valley some thought it was custer at last others thought it was terry a few even guessed crook two officers rode out to investigate a short gallop brought them to the leading ranks of the second cavalry general terry in the van 
both of reno's officers burst out with the same question where is custer gibbon's chief of scouts lieutenant bradley had already discovered the answer on battle ridge four miles downstream he had counted a hundred and ninety seven corpses littering the ground of the five companies that followed custer apparently not a single man had survived although the failure to account for all the bodies left a faint possibility that someone got away hundreds have since claimed to be the only survivor of the battle altogether half the seventh cavalry lay dead or wounded the troopers slain with custer numbered two hundred and ten in reno's retreat from the valley and his defense of the bluffs another fifty-three were killed and sixty wounded how many indians paid for this victory with their lives will never be known for most of the dead were borne off by the living estimates vary from thirty to three hundred indian accounts that tell of many wounded who died later suggest a figure closer to the latter than the former on the morning of june twenty eighth reno's men rode to the custer battlefield to bury the dead a scene of sickening ghastly horror lieutenant godfrey recalled in accordance with indian custom most of the bodies had been stripped of their clothing and scalped and mutilated they lay scattered about the battlefield where they had fallen the bodies of custer and several of his officers lay with about forty others on the western slope of custer hill although cook and tom custer had been badly butchered most in this group escaped severe mutilation the bodies were as recognizable as if they were in life benteen wrote to his wife custer had been stripped but neither scalped nor mutilated one bullet had hit his left breast another his left temple his position was natural observed godfrey and one that we had seen hundreds of times while he was taking cat naps during halts on the march the dead were hastily buried tools were few and in most cases the burial details simply scooped out a shallow grave and covered the body with a thin layer of sandy soil and some clumps of sagebrush the officers were buried more securely and the graves plainly marked for future identification not all was death on the battlefield a few badly wounded cavalry horses were found then destroyed one was not comanche captain keogh's claybank gelding was spared and his wounds dressed never again put to work comanche survived for another fifteen years the seventh cavalry's prized living trophy venerated as the only true survivor of custer's last battle meanwhile reno's sixty wounded men required attention captain marsh had succeeded in pushing the far west up the bighorn to the mouth of the little bighorn and the crew laid beds of freshly cut grass on the deck to receive the wounded gibbon's troops improvised hand litters to carry them the fifteen miles to the steamer these proved too awkward and were replaced with litters rigged on poles strapped to two mules on the morning of june thirty the wounded were carried aboard the far west cautiously captain marsh piloted the far west down the shallow bighorn to its mouth here he waited for two days for terry and gibbon then ferried their commands to the north side of the yellowstone on july three marsh eased his craft into the muddy current for an epic voyage down the yellowstone and the missouri that became legendary in the history of river steamboating at eleven p m on july five draped in black morning cloth and flying the colors at half mast the far west nosed into the bismarck landing marsh had set a speed record never to be topped on the missouri seven hundred and ten miles in fifty four hours while the crew ran around the sleeping town spreading the electrifying news marsh hastened to the telegraph office the operator j m carnahan seated himself at the key and tapped out a terse message bismarck d t july five eighteen seventy six general custer attacked the indians june twenty five and he with every officer and man in five companies were killed it was the first of a series of dispatches that by the end of the next day totaled fifty thousand words meanwhile the far west dropped down the river to fort lincoln the wounded were carried ashore and placed in the post hospital in the pre-dawn gloom of july six 
officers went from house to house waking the occupants and breaking the tragic news to the widows and orphans of the men who had fallen on the little bighorn pursuit even as their comrades sought to overwhelm major reno's command on june twenty six scouts from the village on the little bighorn brought word of more soldiers coming up the valley from the north rather than face this new threat the indians packed up and as reno's troopers watched from the bluff tops pulled out of the valley to the southwest so hastily did they decamp that they left some lodges standing and many of their possessions scattered about the site but they departed exultantly with soaring spirits for never had they won a triumph so stunning and complete for several nights their camps rang with victory celebrations already as they withdrew before terry's advance the great village had grown too unwieldy game had taken flight and hunters could not find enough meat to feed so many people within two days small groups began to spin off to go their own way or head back to the agencies nearing crook's base on goose creek war parties from these groups mauled a scouting detachment from his command and even tried to burn him out of his camp by firing the prairie grass the main village of indians crossed from the upper little bighorn back to the rosebud dropped down that stream a short distance then turned east to the tongue they traveled rapidly searching for buffalo to discourage pursuit they set huge grass fires behind them both crook and terry lay paralyzed in their base camps crook near the head of tongue river terry on the yellowstone at the mouth of the bighorn the enormity of the custer disaster news of which finally reached crook on july ten traumatized both generals and all their subordinates almost at once they began to imagine themselves opposed by many times the actual number of warriors who had inflicted the defeat on custer and they feared a like fate if they ventured forth without heavy reinforcement more troops were on the way the news that the little bighorn had shocked and outraged the american people and newspapers cried for swift reprisal sheridan had fresh troops under orders as soon as he received terry's first dispatches from the yellowstone although sheridan impatiently urged crook to hit em again and hit em hard neither general would move without the additional units it was the first week in august by the time the reinforcements arrived and the two forces got under way by then the fugitive indians had scattered even more with the main camp now still farther to the east in the lower powder valley some of the agency groups had already reached the western edge of the great sioux reservation and a few had even reported themselves at the agencies on august seven terry who had moved down the yellowstone to the mouth of the rosebud started up that stream on custer's old trail with about seventeen hundred infantry and cavalry crook had started down the tongue three days earlier with close to twenty three hundred men but had soon turned west to the rosebud where he picked up the indian trail on august ten to the surprise of all the two columns met at this point the indian trail now more than a month old veered eastward toward the tongue joining forces the two generals led their army of four thousand in pursuit night after night cold rain drenched the lightly clad soldiers and day after day they slogged through the mud trying to catch up with the indians horses weakened the shoes of the infantry shredded morale sank and sickness and fatigue afflicted the exhausted ranks weary and dispirited the army reached the yellowstone at the mouth of the powder on august seventeenth it had labored in vain never had it come closer than a hundred miles to any sizable body of indians at least a week earlier in fact still farther to the east the remaining core of the indian village had fragmented and scattered sitting bull took his people northeast to the lower little missouri crazy horse and the oglalas turned south toward the black hills as the rains continued terry and crook floundered in mud and indecision while also trying to stockpile enough provisions to resume the chase steamboats pushed up from bismarck with supplies fighting for time as the river fell the two generals bickered over what to do next 
terry fearful that sitting bull and other hunk papas would break to the north wanted crook to cooperate in operations to the northeast along the lower yellowstone crook on the other hand fretted over indians heading south toward the red cloud and spotted tail agencies these lay in the department of the platte now uncovered by his absence in terry's department and he wanted to get back to his own area of responsibility at length at the beginning of september they went their separate ways terry made some hesitant probes in several directions then abandoned the field sending most of his army back to their stations crook pointed directly east on the terry custer trail of the previous spring looking for indian sign crook cut loose from terry and the river supply line with but scanty provision and within two days the men were on half rations the bad weather continued adding rain fog and heavy mud to the growing hunger wet cross hungry disgusted noted the general's aide in his diary reflecting not only fatigue discomfort and short rations but also puzzlement over their leader's intentions which he shared with no one finally east of the little missouri he decided on a quick dash to the black hills a hundred and seventy-five miles away what followed is known to history as crook's starvation march for nearly a week the column struggled through constant rain fog and heavy mud in a nightmarish ordeal that pushed exhausted men to the edge of collapse and dropped animals by the score rations gave out and stringy meat cut from butchered horses and mules afforded the only fare faced with calamity crook on september eighth dispatched a mule train to push ahead to deadwood and buy food on the open market captain anson mills and a hundred and fifty cavalrymen mounted on the strongest remaining animals went along as escort preoccupied with more immediate problems no one thought much about indians but near slim buttes mills turned up thirty-seven oglala lodges and at dawn on september nine charged into the sleeping camp crook came up in the afternoon and the troops wiped out the last pockets of resistance american horse the chief died from wounds received in the fight and the lodges were all destroyed from the indian stores the starving soldiers at last obtained food american horses band proved but an outlier of a camp of nearly a hundred lodges under crazy horse some two hundred warriors rode to the attack and fell on crook's two thousand in the evening and next morning the oglala stabbed at defensive lines posted by crook then drew off as the army resumed its march toward the black hills the weary ragged miserable soldiers and their officers as well had lost all incentive for a decisive fight with the sioux not until september thirteen did the terrible trek draw to a close on that day a herd of beef cattle and a train of wagons loaded with provisions met the column and ended the starvation march thus ended too the summer campaign of eighteen seventy six for all the effort it could boast but one success the modest and accidental victory at slim buttes war's end the annihilation of custer's command brought the wrath of the nation down upon the sioux and cheyennes at the agencies as well as those out in the powder and yellowstone country general sheridan authorized to impose military rule began by dismounting and disarming the indians at the agencies many of whom had not been absent during the summer also backed by a stern congressional mandate a commission visited the agencies in september eighteen seventy six to demand the sale of the black hills the chiefs had no choice but to touch the pen thus giving legal validity to the transaction aggressive miners had already made an accomplished fact confronted with the harsh treatment at the agencies many indians who had come in to give up promptly turned about and rejoined their roaming brethren nor did the army abandon all effort to subjugate the roamers terry had left troops to hold the yellowstone through the winter 
and in the spring build two permanent forts that sheridan had persuaded congress were essential to the pacification of the northern plains they threw up a temporary cantonment at the mouth of the tongue river but they did not while away the winter in their huts their young and ambitious commander colonel nelson a miles was a friend and admirer of custer and a practitioner of his aggressive hard-hitting style of war clothing his infantrymen in buffalo overcoats and other cold weather gear he campaigned all through the hard winter months bear's coat the indians named him crook also fielded a winter expedition this time with better results leading his striking arm was another of the army's vigorous young colonels ranald s mackenzie in the misty dawn of november twenty five eighteen seventy six mackenzie and eleven hundred horsemen burst into the cheyenne village of dullknife and little wolf a hundred and eighty-three lodges hidden in a canyon of the red fork of powder river the cheyennes lost their tepees stores of food and clothing and pony herd crazy horse took them in but they no longer had the will to resist by the spring of eighteen seventy seven indians by the hundreds began to drift into the agencies and surrender even crazy horse saw the futility of holding out longer on may sixth eighteen seventy seven he led a procession of more than eleven 1 hundred sioux into camp robinson nebraska and threw his weapons on the ground less than six months later he was dead killed in a guardhouse scuffle it is good observed one of the agency chiefs he has looked for death and it has come sitting bull chose another course vowing never to submit he led some four hundred hunkpapas across the boundary into canada but food was scarce and mild soldiers guarded the border to prevent the indians from hunting buffalo in montana little by little the refugees weakened first gall then crow king brought their followers to fort buford to surrender at last in july eighteen eighty one sitting bull and forty-three families appeared at the fort facing the commanding officer he declared i wish it to be remembered that i was the last man of my tribe to surrender my rifle and this day have given it to you sitting bull's surrender formally marked the end of a war that had all but ended four years earlier when most of the indians who fought the soldiers in eighteen seventy six settled on the reservation in their triumph at the little bighorn the sioux and cheyennes had awakened forces that led to their collapse the campaign of eighteen seventy six had after all accomplished the objectives set by its planners it had forced the indians to abandon the unceded territory and accept government control on the reservation and it had frightened the chiefs into selling the black hills the sioux and cheyennes bitterly submitted to the reservation way of life although it contrasted cruelly with the old ways gradually they came to see that the freedom of the past could never be recaptured for a generation to come however old warriors would recall with satisfaction the brief moment of glory when they wiped out long hair and his blue coats why how could it have happened the question reverberated up and down the army chain of command and quickly spilled over into the newspapers and public journals it was the subject of a court of inquiry that raked over major reno's every act and decision without finding the answer or charging reno and it has echoed through history to this day the simplest explanation usually overlooked in the endless debates over strategy and tactics is that the army lost because the indians won they were strong united well led well armed confident and outraged by the government's war aims rarely had the army encountered such a powerful combination in an indian adversary but this explanation exonerates all the military chiefs and permits no scapegoat in blue the search for one began at once and has been diligently pursued for more than a century in turn terry gibbon crook custer reno and benteen have been indicted and not capriciously for if the blame must fall entirely on the army all bear more or less responsibility the largest current of thought washes up custer as the culprit 
thirsting for glory he was accused of disobeying terry's orders taking a direct instead of a circuitous route to his destination attacking with an exhausted command and without adequate reconnaissance and at the last moment dividing his force in the face of a superior adversary all these charges can be refuted or plausibly explained yet as every officer knows the commander bears ultimate responsibility for the success or failure of his command and george armstrong custer cannot escape this basic military maxim a truer explanation is simply that custer's legendary luck deserted him circumstance piled on circumstance to make him their victim circumstance bad luck appeared to reveal him to his enemy prematurely and forced him into battle before he intended knowing neither terrain nor the exact location or strength of the indian camp he had to grope forward half blindly allowing his battle plan to take shape as circumstances unfolded by the time he knew enough for informed action it was too late benteen had been sent beyond timely recall and reno had been committed to battle both defensible actions when taken it remained only to throw his own immediate command against the indians and even that effort faltered on enemy opposition and difficult terrain the altered timetable moreover precipitated battle in the afternoon rather than at dawn the preferred time when indians tended to be least alert reno ranks next as favored scapegoat critics score him for not pushing his charge against the indian camp or at least for not holding his position in the timber reno's retreat freed large numbers of indians to concentrate on custer at a crucial stage of the action had reno continued to fight in the valley the pressure on custer might well have been decisively lessened what cannot be known is whether such a course would have rewarded reno with the same fate as custer significantly those who followed reno into the valley condemned not the decision to withdraw only the execution more vulnerable is reno's management of the hilltop operation a strong case can be made that he should have rushed to custer's aid no matter what the odds and even at the risk of disaster the written orders to benteen now reno's by virtue of superior rank explicitly required such a move in addition some of his officers urged this course on him in fact reno made no decision and his indecision freed subordinates to go off on their own and in the end endangered the entire command thereafter through a night and day of defensive action reno failed to exhort effective command indeed there is strong evidence that he proposed to pull out altogether abandoning the wounded a proposition that benteen indignantly rejected otherwise reno did not behave discreditably but no one doubted that benteen functioned as the true commander for his part captain benteen failed his superior at a critical point disgruntled over his valley hunting assignment he lingered on the back trail with battle unmistakably joined even two urgent messages from custer could not speed his pace both left no doubt that custer wanted him and the ammunition packs just as swiftly as benteen could get them there instead he kept to the trail joined reno and let him determine what moves if any would next be attempted in the fight for the bluffs, on the other hand, Benteen's strong leadership and cool bravery contributed greatly to the successful defense. Others invite criticism. Neither before nor after the Little Bighorn did Terry, Gibbons, or Crook gather and use intelligence in a thoughtful way. Gibbon repeatedly let opportunity slip from his grasp and failed to keep Terry fully informed crook mismanaged both his march and june offensives withdrawing on both occasions with questionable justification the latter after the rosebud left custer to confront the entire indian strength alone privately general sherman believed that crook bore large responsibility for the failure of the campaign of eighteen seventy six and yet in dissecting strategy and tactics from the perspective of a century later it is easy to do injustice to the responsible commanders 
one cannot know fully all the circumstances of the enemy weather terrain troops weapons and a host of other factors great and trivial that influenced judgment and sometimes decisively shaped the final outcome in particular an officer or any historic person for that matter should be judged solely on the basis of what he knew or could reasonably foresee at a particular time not on what we know now in few events is this principle more pertinent than the battle of the little bighorn to load so much blame on the military officers is to do disservice to the indians they fought well that day perhaps no strategy or tactics could have prevailed against sitting bull's powerful medicine sidebar dr henry r porter shown here long after the fight was the only one of three doctors attached to the seventh cavalry during the eighteen seventy six campaign to survive the battle the chief medical officer dr george e lord died with custer while dr james m de wolf was killed during reno's flight from the valley the site of porter's field hospital which he set up in a depression atop the bluffs during reno's hilltop fight can still be seen at the reno benteen battlefield sidebar chartered by the government for the campaign of eighteen seventy six the far west performed important service in transporting troops supplies and dispatches with reno's wounded on board the boat steamed from the mouth of the bighorn to bismarck seven hundred and ten miles in fifty-four hours a record unsurpassed in steamboating on the upper missouri sidebar custer battlefield looking southwest about three years after the fight wooden stakes mark the graves of the dead on custer hill each stake contained an empty shell casing holding the name of the grave's occupant if it was known the little bighorn river lies beyond the tree line in the distance beyond that is the valley in which the large indian village was located captain keogh's marker in the summer of eighteen seventy seven captain keogh's reconstituted company i returned to the battlefield to reclaim the bodies of the officers and rebury those of the enlisted men two years later the graves were remounded by a burial party under captain george k sanderson of the eleventh infantry shown here looking at keogh's marker on the spot where he fell captain keogh's clay bank gelding comanche was near death from arrow and bullet wounds when it was found on the battlefield the horse was taken to fort lincoln and nursed back to health it lived another fifteen years dying in eighteen ninety one at the age of twenty eight holding the reins is blacksmith gustav korn a former private in keogh's company i who served as the horse's keeper until his death at the battle of wounded knee in eighteen ninety sidebar would gatling guns have saved custer yes argued general henry j hunt who had commanded the army of the potomac's artillery in the civil war a gatling battery would probably have saved the command and the day as well drawn by condemned cavalry horses and manned by infantrymen the gatling gun pictured here at fort lincoln was one of three that accompanied general terry's column terry offered them to custer on june twenty one together with major james brisbane's battalion of the second cavalry custer refused the gatlings he said would slow his march emplaced atop custer hill the three gatlings might well have saved the day by turning a crank and feeding the ammunition into a hopper a gatling crew could spew up to three hundred and fifty rounds a minute from the bank of revolving barrels such firepower might have held the indians at bay until help came or even stampeded them on the other hand gatlings were temperamental they easily fouled by residue from black powder cartridges and often jammed when overheated also as custer observed they were slow and cumbersome on the trail as it turned out terry's battery had a hard time even keeping up with gibbon's infantry they are worthless for indian fighting attested general nelson a miles thus it is difficult to conceive of any circumstances in which the gatling guns would still have been with custer when he reached the hill where he died 
surely the restless impatient custer would not have let them hold back his swift march to the little bighorn at best they would have been consigned to the pack train when he divided the regiment at worst left somewhere back on the trail to catch up as speedily as possible sidebar the reno court of inquiry inevitably the search for someone to blame focused on custer's second in command major marcus a reno custer's first biographer frederick whittaker charged reno with cowardice in failing to rush to his commander's aid whittaker's thick volume rushed into print within six months of the battle demanded that the army launch an investigation reno himself requested an official inquiry the reno court of inquiry convened at chicago's palmer house on january thirteenth eighteen seventy nine trim in colorful dress uniforms the witnesses and officers of the court attracted wide attention both in chicago and throughout the nation the judges two colonels and a lieutenant colonel sat for four weeks and heard the testimony of twenty-three witnesses most of the surviving officers who had fought at the little bighorn a few enlisted men civilian participants and major reno himself shown seated in front of the right window in this newspaper woodcut of the trial took the stand to give their version of what happened and why although conducted under military law and procedure a court of inquiry can only recommend further judicial proceedings the task of the reno court of inquiry was not to assess guilt but to determine whether enough evidence existed to warrant trying major reno before a court-martial ably defended by civilian counsel and perhaps aided by officers reluctant to bring disgrace on the seventh cavalry reno emerged from the ordeal with the court's half-hearted vindication the finding while subordinates in some instances did more for the safety of the command by brilliant displays of courage than did major reno there was nothing in his conduct which requires animadversion from this court the court's conclusion hardly stilled the debate in fact it only stoked new disputes reno did not participate court-martialed on other unrelated charges he was dismissed from the army and died a decade later a broken man the controversies lived on however and whether reno could have saved custer or should have tried is vehemently argued to this day for historians the record of the reno court of inquiry is invaluable ironically though this mountain of first-hand evidence has brought students no closer to definitive answers than it did the judges who first pondered it more than a century ago sidebar the faces on the barroom wall no faces in american history have inspired greater boozy contemplation than those of the adams becker rendering below of the men who struggled atop custer hill on june twenty five eighteen seventy six cassilly adams painted the original in eighteen eighty six a huge stilted undramatic composition intended as a travelling exhibition but it remained for otto becker recreating the canvas in eighteen ninety six for a lithograph by the anhauser bush brewing company to beget the version shown here that adorned the saloon walls of the nation for a generation ultimately a million copies of the becker print rolled off the presses prompting one authority to speculate that it had been viewed by more low brows and fewer art critics than any other picture in american history the adams becker painting is by all odds the most known but hardly the only one and assuredly not the most fanciful in the late nineteen sixties the staff of the amon carter museum in fort worth attempted to catalogue the many pictures of the custer fight each of the more than nine hundred versions identified is of course the product of the artist's imagination in a situation where imagination may properly replace truth no witness survived to contest the artist it is curious that almost every artist to the present time has been absorbed in the reality of the event and has neglected the human overtones the sullen quiet of the indian betrayed the sudden surprise and totality of death on the vast plains the frustration of the hindsight judgments 
the responsibilities and loyalties obliterated in the aftermath there were no victors that day just survivors each aware that a day of reckoning had passed and another would soon be upon them as in any disaster many people learned much but too late end of sidebars end of section two d part three custer battlefield today of custer battlefield by robert m utley this librivox recording is in the public domain part three custer battlefield today from battlefield to national monument almost overnight the site of the battle of the little bighorn became a national shrine and tourist attraction its care fell to the army which in eighteen seventy seven built fort custer fifteen miles to the north a year after the battle captain keogh's old company i of the seventh cavalry now reconstituted returned to comb the battlefield and exhume the bodies of custer and eleven other officers and two civilians for reinterment elsewhere in accordance with custer's wishes his widow had his remains reburied at the united states military academy at west point new york in eighteen seventy nine custer battlefield was designated a national cemetery and the fort custer troopers worked to make it more presentable on top of custer hill they erected a log memorial they remounted the scattered graves and marked each with a substantial wooden stake in eighteen eighty one an imposing granite monument bearing the names of all the slain arrived at the fort custer landing and soon replaced the log memorial on custer hill at the same time the remains of the fallen troopers were exhumed from their individual graves and reinterred in a common grave around the base of the monument in eighteen ninety white marble headstones replaced the wooden stakes marking the original graves and thus formed a rough guide to where the soldiers had been killed as indian warfare subsided the army began to abandon its frontier forts custer battlefield national cemetery offered a convenient place to move the bodies buried in the various post cemeteries gradually the dead from other indian battles took their place in the national cemetery at the foot of custer hill they serve as reminders of the whole sweep of military history on the northern great plains the first battlefield superintendent arrived in eighteen ninety three for almost fifty years afterward a succession of war department officials cared for the area many were retired soldiers some veterans of the sioux campaign of eighteen seventy six their personal knowledge of the battle served them well in dealing with the growing number of visitors people came the custodians discovered not so much to visit the national cemetery as to see the scene of custer's last stand many were avid relic hunters and curiosity seekers and often carried off mementos ranging from cartridge cases to human bones and above all fragments of the marble headstones in nineteen forty stewardship passed from the war department to the national park service of the department of the interior reflecting the changed emphasis on historic site rather than active cemetery custer battlefield national cemetery was renamed custer battlefield national monument in nineteen forty six preserving and interpreting the battlefield now became the principal mission interpretation underwent changes too originally established to pay homage to the fallen soldiers and white civilians the battlefield came gradually to stand for the indian side of the story as well and interpretation expanded to fill the void today custer battlefield fittingly commemorates not only the westward advance of the american frontier but also the last phases of the indian struggle to retain their lands and way of life modern indians some descendants of those who fought custer and others of indian scouts who served custer share with white interpreters the task of explaining the battle of the little bighorn to the hundreds of thousands of visitors who come each year the following guide highlights the principal battlefield features sidebar visitor center the exhibits and interpretive programs here will help you understand the battle and the ground on which it was fought 
the museum features numerous military and indian artifacts artwork dioramas and audiovisual programs dealing with the sioux war of 1876 the battle and the lives of soldiers and indians the visitor center is also a depository for significant collections of documents and memorabilia including the elizabeth b custer collection of more than five thousand letters and other papers the battle is best understood by beginning the battlefield tour at the reno benteen battlefield four and a half miles from the visitor center wayside exhibits will then be in sequence on the return trip this guide is arranged in the same order consult the map on page ninety five for orientation among the park's indian artifacts are a pair of beaded moccasins that purportedly belonged to sitting bull and a sioux war bonnet the park's seventh cavalry collection includes the uniform coat of sergeant william williams a private in company h at the time of the battle a buckskin jacket owned by lieutenant colonel george a custer lieutenant w w cook's dress helmet one of captain thomas custer's regimental shoulder knots and lieutenant colonel custer's commission sidebar archaeology on the battlefield nineteen eighty four and nineteen eighty five in august nineteen eighty three a prairie fire swept over custer battlefield consuming nearly six hundred acres of the six hundred and forty acre site with the battlefield stripped of vegetation the national park service saw an opportunity to initiate archaeological investigation hoping the barren hills and ravines would reveal some of the battle closely guarded secrets for five weeks in the spring of nineteen eighty four and again in nineteen eighty five a team of archaeologists and volunteers combed the park nearly five thousand artifacts were recovered yielding primarily expended cartridges like those shown at right fired by soldier or brave during the battle and aiding in site identification of indian positions excavations around marble markers placed on the field in eighteen ninety to show where soldiers had been originally interred they were exhumed in eighteen eighty one and placed in a mass grave at the top of custer hill produced a scattering of human bones missed in previous reburial efforts more importantly the excavations substantiated the historical record that the markers are reasonably accurate in approximating where soldiers had been buried readers note the rest of this text has been obscured by an illustration sidebar wolf mountain and crow's nest standing at the monument on the reno benteen battlefield face to the southeast or your left the mountains on the skyline are the wolf mountains or chadish as the crow indians called them they divide the drainages of the rosebud and little bighorn valleys to your left near a low saddle in the northern end of the mountains is a promontory the crows called the crow's nest before sunrise on june twenty five eighteen seventy six custer's crow and arakara scouts ranging in advance of the seventh cavalry climbed this lookout from here they sighted the indian encampment in the little bighorn valley fifteen miles distant sidebar reno creek and lone tepee site custer's approach to the little bighorn lay down the narrow valley of a stream then known as sundance or ash creek but later renamed reno creek in honor of major reno the creek rises in the low pass through the northern end of the wolf mountains mentioned above a thread of timber marking the lower part is visible from the reno benteen battlefield along this stretch of the stream at a site never conclusively identified stood the lone tepee left standing when the sioux moved a week earlier this tepee contained the body of a warrior killed at the battle of the rosebud at this point scouts reported enemy warriors to the front and custer ordered major reno in pursuit sidebar reno's valley fight looking west and slightly to the right from the reno benteen monument one sees the garytown post office at a point on the highway and railroad where a timbered bend of the little bighorn river sweeps almost across the valley immediately to the right or north of this point lay the upper end of the sioux and cheyenne indian village 
after crossing the river at the mouth of reno creek reno and his command advanced down the valley this far opposed here by several hundred mounted warriors he dismounted his troopers in a thin skirmish line quickly outflanked he withdrew them to the timber on his right this too proved untenable and he led his men in retreat across the open valley in the foreground toward the bluffs where the monument is located sidebar reno retreat crossing repeated assaults on both flanks and rear of reno's retreating column made crossing the little bighorn river difficult and dangerous recalled lieutenant luther r hare the crossing was not covered and no effort was made to hold the indians back if the indians had followed us in force to the hilltop they would have got us all sidebar reno benteen battlefield after retreating from the valley to the bluffs reno and his shattered command took positions in the vicinity of the present reno benteen monument here reno was shortly joined by captain benteen and his battalion and soon afterward by captain mcdougall and the pack train after wiping out custer four miles to the north the sioux and cheyenne warriors laid siege to reno at this site the command about four hundred strong entrenched in a rough circle around the saucer-like depression just south of the monument in this sheltered swale dr porter established the hospital beginning at the monument entrenchment trail provides an interpretive tour of reno's defensive position sidebar sharpshooters ridge from the reno benteen parking area proceed point four mile back along the tour road to your right parallel to the road and two hundred yards distant is a long ridge that took its name from an unusually skilled indian marksman recalled first sergeant john ryan there was a high ridge on the right and one indian in particular i must give credit for being a good shot while we were lying in the line he fired a shot and killed the fourth man on my right soon afterward he fired again and shot the third man his third shot wounded the man on my right who jumped back from the line and down among the rest of the wounded i thought my turn was coming next i jumped up with captain french and some half a dozen members of my company and instead of firing straight to the front as we had been doing we wheeled to our right and put in a deadly volley and i think we put an end to that indian as there were no more men killed at that particular spot sidebar weir point a drive of one point two miles on the road back toward custer battlefield leads to a high peak through which the road has been cut named for captain thomas b weir this marks the limit of advance by elements of major reno's command in the effort to open communications with custer a brisk skirmish occurred here with hundreds of warriors returning from the custer battlefield and reno's men were ordered to withdraw to the bluff top positions where the monument now stands sidebar indian village approaching weir point and descending its north face the tour road affords good views of the little bighorn valley to the west this was the site of the indian village custer first glimpsed it from the bluffs near where reno and benteen later fought approximately three miles long the village covered much of the valley west of the river from present gary owen post office to a point almost opposite battle ridge sidebar medicine tail coulee from weir point the tour road drops one point six miles to the crossing of medicine tail coulee to the west about three hundred yards the coulee empties into the little bighorn river descending medicine tail coulee part of custer's command encountered indians at its mouth and after an exchange of fire and possibly some casualties retreated to the north and east to battle ridge sidebar nigh cartwright ridge named for two students of the battle who discovered firing positions marked by expended cartridge cases nigh cartwright ridge lies one half mile east of the marker denoting where sergeant james butler was found the ridge forms part of the divide between medicine tail and deep coulees a battalion of custer's force fought dismounted defensive actions on this ridge before moving on to battle ridge how the troopers got here is one of the battle's imponderables 
some believe they may have become separated from the rest of the command as a result of indian gunfire in medicine tail coulee others think that men were deployed to keep warriors from enveloping custer's right flank still others maintain that the soldiers were posted on the ridge to protect the expected approach of the pack train as it emerged into medicine tail coulee sidebar markers from medicine tail coulee the tour rises one point one miles to the south entrance to the custer battlefield from here to the monument at the north end of battle ridge the road affords a view of the terrain over which custer's command fought with sioux and cheyenne warriors in the final death struggle white marble markers may be seen in seemingly random patterns on both sides of the road although some are known to be misplaced most of them mark the locations where the bodies of slain troopers were buried immediately after the battle since the dead soldiers were buried at or very near where they fell these markers sketch in rough outline the progress of the fighting all the remains were later reinterred in a common grave at the monument so these markers do not now identify graves no markers show where indians fell the bodies of dead warriors were removed from the field and later placed in teepees or caves sidebar calhoun hill from the south entrance, the route lies between markers on both sides of the roadway. The markers probably indicate where men of Company C fell. The road continues to a loop around the perimeter of Calhoun Hill. Here, the two parts of Custer's command that had fought at the mouth of Medicine Tail and on Nye Cartwright Ridge probably reunited and began the movement along the top of Battle Ridge to the north. In the final action, Lieutenant James Calhoun's Company L fought and died at this position. Sidebar Battle Ridge The tour road follows the crest of Battle Ridge between Calhoun Hill and the monument on Custer Hill. Fighting northward along this ridge, Custer's command came finally to its last stand near the present monument. Sidebar Company I Position the markers scattered along the east slope of Battle Ridge between Calhoun Hill and Custer Hill represent the destruction of Captain Miles W. Keel's Company I. Keel's body was found amid a cluster of his own men and a few from Company C. A charge up this drainage from the north led by Crazy Horse is usually credited with destroying Keel's command. Sidebar Deep Ravine west of battle ridge toward the river deep ravine was the scene of heavy fighting no headstones today represent this action but ample evidence testifies to it as sergeant Daniel knipe recalled i went along the line of dead bodies toward the river and riding along the edge of the deep gully about two thousand feet from where the monument now stands i counted twenty-eight bodies in the gulch how these men came to be killed here and why no markers were placed here remain mysteries archaeological excavations in 1984 failed to solve the riddle sidebar custer hill the remnants of custer's command gathered on the western slope of battle ridge at its northern end just below the present monument they shot their horses for breastworks and fought the last stand of history and legend after the battle, Lt. Edward S. Godfrey, one of Reno's officers, counted 42 men here behind a barricade of 39 dead horses. One of the bodies was Custer's. At what stage of the fighting he fell is not known. Some Indian accounts tell of a soldier in buckskin, fitting Custer's description, being shot at the ford at the mouth of Medicine Tail Coulee. Whatever happened, Custer's body was identified in the last stand group just below the crest of the ridge. Next to him lay his brother Tom, mutilated almost beyond recognition. In contrast, Colonel Custer's remains escaped mutilation, prompting speculation that he had been spared out of respect. Most Indian accounts, however, indicate that the warriors recognized no particular person among the soldiers. As the Oglala Low Dog remarked, everything was in confusion all the time of the battle i did not see general custer i do not know who killed him we did not know till the fight was over that he was the white chief among the headstones in this group 
are those of george tom and boston custer as well as other officers on top of the hill stands the monument erected in 1881, bearing the names of all officers and soldiers killed in the battle. The remains of the slain troopers lay in a common grave around its base. Sidebar National Cemetery Nearly 5,000 soldiers and their dependents are buried in Custer Battlefield National Cemetery originally established to commemorate the dead of the battle it was later expanded to receive veterans of all wars and their dependents interments include soldiers from the indian wars the spanish-american war world wars one and two the korean war and the vietnam war major reno moved from elsewhere in 1967 and lieutenant john j crittenden who fell on calhoun hill are also buried here the cemetery has been officially closed to burials since 1977. End sidebars. End part three. End of Custer Battlefield, A History and Guide to the Battle of the Little Bighorn by Robert M. Utley.